Hello, hello! Today I'm going to be painting this adorable little character in the background while I talk about real life cows and some of the reasons why I don't eat meat. I'm going to leave a little warning here. You can definitely mute this video if you don't want to hear me talk about animal agriculture and its specific um, practices. Some of the practices I'll be discussing will be pretty heavy, so do what's best for your own peace of mind. And without further ado, let's get into it. For those of you still listening, I've done a lot of research into specific brands that I myself can purchase at my local grocery store here in Canada, so keep in mind I will only be talking about Canadian agriculture in this video. I also want to make it clear that my intention here is to shed light on the industry's practices and regulations um, and is in no way meant to attack anyone as a consumer. The information I'm listing here will also be cited below if you would like to look into it yourself. So for starters, a lot of people think that family farming and factory farming are two separate entities. However, family farms can also be factory farms, and in my opinion, I find it kind of scummy and confusing to use language like this, but it's still technically legal. A family farm is just referring to those um, who own the company, not how they work, their size, intensity, or their practices in processing the animals. Even the word processing is a very clean and emotionless way of talking about killing and cleaning an animal for consumption. Now I've also heard some content creators like um, Vegan Teacher <laughs> use language like consuming flesh and fluids or murdering the innocent. And I'd like to intentionally avoid this because I want the facts to speak for themselves. I don't need to emotionally manipulate you into agreeing with me. If you do hear me using language like this, I want you to know that it's because I'm directly quoting something, so that being said, let's get into the statistics. There's a lot of information available out there from a lot of very biased sources, which is concerning to me. Just trying to find the water footprint for a pound of beef gave me incredibly varied results depending on who I was asking. I ended up going with the answer from USGS, since they're very scientific and created by an act of Congress in 1879. I'll admit the .gov in their website made me feel more comfortable sharing this. So their findings were that it took 1,840 gallons per pound of beef. Estimates vary a lot due to different conditions of raising cows. The number also varies depending on how far back in the production chain you go. It takes a lot of water to grow grain, forage, and roughage to feed a cow. Water is also needed for drinking supplies as well as for servicing the cow. Per kilogram of product, animal products generally have a larger water footprint than crop products. To put that into perspective, that's 29,440 cups or 6,965 liters of water. I'd also like to compare that footprint to some other things, again just for perspective sake. One cup of coffee requires 35 gallons, a pound of bread requires about 200 gallons, and one pound of corn requires 110 gallons. Now let's take a look at just the sheer amount of cows in Canada. Back in the good year 2000, there were 124,025 farms reported having cattle in Canada, with an average of 106 cows per farm. In 2021, 71,330 farms reported having cattle, with an average of 156 cows per farm. I pulled this information directly from Statistics Canada. So basically, the steady trend in Canada has been to have less farms with more animals. A large part of this is due to selective breeding and the use of hormones, which significantly reduce the lifespan of farm animals, so that they reach slaughtering age extremely young. But enough with the statistics, let's talk about the actual laws and regulations around animal agriculture in Canada. From what I've found, there are little to no government inspections, no public audits, and generally no transparency when it comes to animal agriculture. There was even a law passed in Ontario last year that makes it illegal to go undercover to reveal animal abuse, food safety risks, and unsafe working conditions that are pervasive in animal agriculture. Ontario's ag-gag law prohibits entering farms or slaughterhouses under false pretenses, making it illegal for journalists, animal protection advocates, and others to document and publicly expose animal abuse or other unlawful activities, even if they're working there. I can't speak for everyone, but I don't trust the lack of transparency when it comes to this. 
From here on out, I will be reading directly from the Code of Practice for Handling of Cattle. There are separate documents for beef and dairy cattle, and it was a lot to read through. <laughs> I'm going to read the whole thing, <laughs> and then I will summarize it for you. So we will just be going over some of the common practices and the laws around those. Starting with space restrictions. Um, this varies depending on the type of barn. 73% of barns in Canada are tie stall barns, but my province has 96% freestyle barns, and Quebec has the record with 2,687 tie stall barns, um, as far as what was documented on this specific survey. So for beef, stocking density must be managed such that weight gain and duration of time spent laying is not adversely affected by crowding. All cattle in a group must have sufficient space to adopt normal resting postures at the same time. Cattle kept in groups must be allowed to move freely around the pen and access feed and water. For dairy cows, it says housing must allow cattle to easily stand up, lay down, and adopt normal resting postures, and have visual contact with other cattle. Cattle must have a bed that provides comfort, insulation, warmth, dryness, and traction, Bare concrete is not acceptable as a resting surface. It also says that stocking density must not exceed 1.2 cows per stall in a freestall system. How you get 1.2 cows? Now, tagging and branding are things. All cattle must be identified using an approved ear tag as stipulated by acceptable regulations. This goes for beef or dairy cattle. Um, the rules on branding are a bit different. For beef cattle, when branding is required for export by policy or just as permanent proof of ownership, it must be performed with proper equipment, restraint by personnel with training, um, and sufficient combination of knowledge and experience to minimize pain to the animal. Um, which is funny because just not branding it would minimize pain to the animal. But I will continue. For dairy cattle, Pain control must be used if branding is necessary. For beef cattle, it's just recommended that you ask about it. Then you have dehorning and disbudding. Um, so for dairy cows, pain control must be used when dehorning or disbudding. Bleeding control must also be used. For beef cows, you should seek guidance from your veterinarian on the availability and advisability of pain control for disbudding or dehorning beef cattle. Disbud calves as early as practically possible, while horn development is still at the horn bud stage. And then they added a little extra in 2016 that says you have to use pain control in consultation with a veterinarian to mitigate pain associated with the horning calves after the horn bud attachment. But if it's before the horn bud attachment, you just have to like ask about it. You don't have to pain control, which is interesting that you do have to with dairy cows. This is going to be a common thing. So then there's castration, <laughs> um, which they say makes the meat taste better, which is um, interesting to think about. <laughs> so again, the rules vary for beef and dairy. For dairy cows, it just says pain control must be used. For beef cows, it says seek guidance from your veterinarian on the optimum method and timing of castration, as well as the availability and advisability of pain control. Um, and then it has a little update and it says use pain control when castrating bulls older than nine months of age. And that's from 2016. And then in 2018, they updated it again to say when castrating bulls older than six months of age. So they're slowly getting better it's still pretty awful, but you know. <laughs> then you have transport. Beef cattle must receive feed and water within five hours prior to loading if transport will exceed 24 hours. <laughs> That's a long time without food. There was nothing written down under the requirements for dairy cattle about the amount of time in transport. Um, yeah. Then um, there's this thing that's called an electric trainer. Um, there's nothing written about trainers for beef cattle, and it says that it's a tie stall thing. So basically, um, they shock the cow when her back arches to go pee or poo, and it trains her to step backwards so that she does it in the gutter instead of her bedding. 
Um, and there are some rules about the wattage and that it needs to be adjustable, but overall I, I think I would hate being electrically shocked every time I had to pee. I don't know. Um, basically, after knowing all this and how these animals are treated, I just couldn't bring myself to eat meat anymore. At the end of the day, for me, I just, I couldn't justify giving these people money when it was just as feasible for me to eat something else. So, um, instead of ending this video on a really depressing note, I would like to share some snacks that I absolutely love that are totally animal friendly. Let's just spread some positivity and talk about how good junk food is, you know? So my all-time list of delicious treats includes none other than trail mix, sweet chili heat Doritos, barbecue chips, except Pringles, fuck you Pringles, onion rings, Oreos, french fries, bugles, licorice, caramel Werther's, you can get dairy-free Ben and Jerry's, and last but not least, Sour Patch Watermelons. <laughs> I hope this video was interesting for you, perhaps a touch educational. If not, maybe you just enjoyed watching me do art stuff. Until next time, stay groovy, space cadet.